is a member's business debate on motion number 5871 in the name of Bob Doris on Kurdish contribution to Scotland. Remembering Halabja. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. Mr Doris, if you'd like to open the debate, please, seven minutes. Okay. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to begin by welcoming my Kurdish constituents from Glasgow, in particular a young man, Mr Shaka Sata, who has inspired me to secure this debate in Scotland's National Parliament. It may be a politician opening this debate, but it's very much the Kurds of Glasgow that have brought this to the Parliament here this afternoon. I also welcome Kurds from various parts of Scotland and from across the UK and beyond that are here today, and I thank you for your support. I know, I know that this debate has generated much interest in Kurdistan and in Kurdish communities uh, around the world, and I want to say a few words to pay respect to them. Emma Serburzin Bakurdakani, Scotland. Bashtari Kurdakan Lakomogai Emada Gringa Boman. Scotland Hurjis Karasata Tirsnakakani Halubja Anfal Liad Nakat Kabuna Hoy Hatini Shmariki Zori Kurd Bo Wolat Kaman. I hope. Presiding officer, I hope I said we are proud of Scotland's Kurds. Their contribution to our society is valued by our nation. Scotland will never forget the horrific events at Halabja and the brutal Anfal campaign that brought many Kurds to our shores. This debate is an opportunity to pay tribute and thanks to them and for all they do for Scotland. It is also important that we stand in solidarity with Scotland's Kurds and recognise the pain and suffering that led many of them and their families to come to Scotland in the first place. As it is now 25 years since the horrors of Halabja and Danfal, it is both right and timely that Scotland shows that solidarity today. Presiding officer, we must all do what we can to prevent such genocide, such acts against humanity, ever happening again. Never forgetting these events, and recognising them as genocide, for me, is fundamental to ensuring that, 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 that this is indeed the case. Indeed, two other motions before the Scottish Parliament seek to do likewise. The genocide has been recognised. Firstly, in 2005, the International Court of Justice in The Hague did recognise it. In 2007, they again said at an appeal there was genocidal intent. Between 2007 and 2010, the Iraqi Supreme Court ruled that the 1988 attacks on Kurdish population constituted genocide. That genocide has been acknowledged in the Swedish, Norwegian and Westminster parliaments by members there. On the 16th of March 1988, indiscriminate rocket, phosphorus and napalm attacks fell upon Halabja. Chemical weapons likely to have included mustard gas, Various nerve agents and cyanide were carried by Iraqi MiG and Mirage fighters. Up to 5,000 Kurds died and 10,000 were injured. Most were women and children. Many died instantly. Others didn't, however. They died painfully afterwards from their injuries, in some cases much, much later. No one can ever quantify the physical pain and mental anguish of those that survived. However, the long-term effects, they can be quantified, such as, for instance, presiding officer, higher probabilities of miscarriage, infertility, birth defects, blood malignancies, and cancer. Al-Anfal in 1988 was part of wider attacks on Kurds over a two-year period, from March 1987 to April 1989. Kurds were, Kurds were forced to endure great pain during this period. This evil campaign was led by Ali Hassan al-Majid, notoriously known as Chemical Ali, Saddam Hussein's first cousin. The scale of the horror was massive. Thousands, perhaps 90% of all Kurdish villages in Iraq were destroyed. 
Official figures document 100,000 persons disappearing in 1988 alone, although some Kurdish sources claim that could be as high as 182,000. Those abducted or arrested were often sent to concentration camps, where women and children were separated from military-aged men, as were the elderly and infirm. Presiding officer, many Kurds across the world, many displaced because of these very events, live with the memory of these atrocities. For younger Kurds in Glasgow and elsewhere, they have heard of these stories of these events, and it is vitally important that the younger generation grow up in the knowledge and understanding of the suffering of the last generation, and I know that many of them certainly do. However, it is not just Kurds that should remember such terrible events, it is all of us. Before today's debate, Fergus Ewing MSP told me about his work with Kurds in Glasgow in the late 1980s and early 1990s. He recalls attending a ceremony in one of Glasgow's large parks in Queen's Park. A tree was planted by Kurdish families to remember those whose lives were lost at Halabja. That small gesture, a small gesture in itself, is a powerful symbol of solidarity with Glasgow's Kurds and Kurds everywhere. I am sure that there have been similar events across Scotland over the years, remembering Halabja and Anfal. And perhaps the Scottish Government can consider how to support such future activities in a coordinated fashion. I said that such genocide must never be allowed to happen again. Looking at the world, we see how troubled it can be. Remembering the pain and suffering of history is crucial to that. But so is how people respond. Peace and mutual respect are vital ingredients to that response also. For Glasgow and for Scotland, it should also be about celebrating our Kurdish communities. The doctors, the lawyers, the engineers that contribute to our society, but also the asylum seekers and refugees who still need much support and assistance. I started by mentioning Shaka Sata at the start of my speech. His response to these atrocities when he came to Scotland as a boy was to grow up steadfast in the belief that helping his community in Glasgow was how Shaka could play his part in ensuring some form of positive legacy from such terrible, terrible crimes. It is a privilege to work with him and others on that task. Presiding officer, Scotland is a more rich and, vi and vibrant place because of the contribution many new Scots have made to our nation. Glasgow's Kurds are a powerful part of that mix. Can I finish, though, by noting that today we commemorate with sadness the events of Halabja and Anfal, but just as importantly, just as crucially, we also celebrate, celebrate the contribution Glasgow's and Scotland's Kurds have made to our nation. Thank you very much. I now call on Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to congratulate Bob Doris on securing this evening's members' debate on so important a subject. And I very much echo the sentiment expressed in the motion which welcomes the role that Kurds and other migrants play in making Scotland a vibrant and multicultural country. Indeed, this has always been the position of the Scottish Labour Party and the approach of this Parliament since its inception. Modern Scotland is a place which views ethnic diversity as a strength, a multicultural society which sees new citizens in a positive light. And such variety enriches our communities and indeed our democracy. But tragically, in Iraq, the Kurdish people have over many de decades faced significant and indeed violent opposition to their desire to progress towards an acceptable degree of Kurdish autonomy. As far back as 1960, Kurds led, led, led by Mustafa Barzani were engaged in heavy fighting against successive Iraqi regimes. In 1970, Iraq did announce a peace plan providing for Kurdish autonomy, but of course it didn't last. And by 1974, 
the Iraqi government had begun a new offensive against the Kurds. During the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, the regime implemented anti-Kurdish policies and a de facto civil war broke out. Shamefully, although the Iraqi regime was widely and rightly condemned by the international community, it was never punished for its actions. Not for the deportation of thousands of Kurds to central and southern Iraq, nor for the complete destruction of villages, nor even yet for the mass murder of thousands of Kurdish civilians. The Member's motion rightly focuses our attention on the notorious attack on Halabja in northern Iraq on the 16th of March 1988. This atrocity was perhaps the most infamous episode in a genocidal, genocidal campaign waged between 1986 and 1988 by the Iraqi regime. They do not deserve the name government, so I don't intend to use it. And they waged this against the Kurdish people. This included the use of ground offensives, aerial bombing, systematic destruction of settlements, firing squads, and the horror of this largest chemical weapons attack directed against a civilian populated area in history. And we should never forget the attack which killed up to 5,000 people and injured up to 10,000 more, predominantly civilians, because thousands more died of complications, disease and birth defects, as we've heard, in the years after the attack. It is right that the Member's motion reminds us that the attack in Halabja was part of the larger Anfal campaign led by the bloody tyrant Saddam Hussein. It is also right that this Parliament welcomes the 2005 Hague decision that formally recognised the 1988 attack as genocide, just as the UK, Swedish and Norwegian parliaments have done. Hopefully, such an approach will help to generate aware awareness of what the Kurdish people have endured in their struggle for democracy. Presiding officer, in a meeting last year, I had the pleasure of meeting some representatives of the Kurdish government courtesy of my colleague Hansla Malik, and also the privilege of being able to take part in an interview with Kurdistan Television. And I think this helps to demonstrate how things have begun to change since the fall of Saddam Hussein, because conditions for those in Iraqi Kurdistan have changed. Literacy has increased significantly. Infant mortality has fallen. There are now seven universities where there used to be one. And there is, of course, a regional devolved government in Iraqi Kurdistan. But this is not to argue that the invasion was correct, or indeed the only option, or that all is now well for the Kurdish community. But it does illustrate, I believe, that matters of war and peace are more complex and their consequences less easy to predict than some of the one-dimensional analysis that is sometimes evident. Presiding on, uh, officer, it is an honour to have representatives of the Kurdish community living in my home city of Glasgow. It is also an honour to have those representatives of the Kurdish community in Parliament again today, and I very much look forward to meeting them later this evening, and I am grateful to my colleague Bob Doris for having the motion in the first place. Many thanks. Now call on Jim Media to be followed by John Lamont. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too congratulate Bob Doris for securing this debate on a subject of international importance and for affording our national parliament the opportunity to mark the tremendous contribution which the Kurdish community makes to Scotland. It is right that we mark and remember the 25th anniversary of the horrific attack on Halabja, which left up to 5,000 people dead and another 7,000 to 10,000 people injured mostly unarmed women and children. This attack featured indiscriminate use of chemical weapons such as mustard gas as well as conventional bombardment and has led the UK, Norwegian and Swedish parliaments, as Bob Doris reminded us, to recognise these acts as genocide. It is also right and proper that we mark the fact that Kurdish cultural heritage is rooted in one of the world's oldest cultures, and we in Scotland owe a great deal, a great debt of gratitude to the many Kurds who have chosen to make Scotland their home. The addition of a people with such a noble culture steeped in history has made a great contribution to the rich and vibrant tapestry of life that is present in Scotland and helps make our nation such a vibrant and diverse place to live. The Kurdish people are the largest national minority in the world that has no homeland, but we in Scotland can be proud of the fact 
that according to the Kurdish Cultural Association, over 2,000 Kurds have chosen to make Scotland their home. As Kurds around the world have recently celebrated the festival of Nowruz, the Kurdish New Year, last week, I would like to offer my sincere thanks to all Kurds present here today and throughout Scotland for the contribution they make to the country they now call home. I am proud to have members of the Kurdish diaspora within my own constituency, a people that are renowned for their hard work as well as their tenacity in the face of adversity and brutality. Around the world, the Kur Kurdish culture is famous for its ancient history and distinct culture transmitted through art, dance and song, and despite a long history of oppression that includes the banning of the written and spoken Kurdish word, the Kurdish people have a rich literary history. However, the defining trait of Kurdish culture is their language, which until very recently was brutally suppressed. And despite this oppression the Kurdish people have faced, they continue to speak their language, in which Bob Doris opened this debate. Scotland is a country that celebrates cultural diversity, and this is particularly true in our cosmopolitan capital. We are proud that the Edinburgh Kurdish Society have been based here since 1993, and we benefit greatly from the addition they make to the local community. One recent event saw the, the Edinburgh Kurdish Society open their doors to people of all cultures and creeds to share ideas and discuss how greater links could be forged between the many cultures that are present in Scotland. There are many similarities between our two lands that we recall this evening, not least the fact that the Kurdish national dish of sarup, made from all the best bits of a sheep, sewn up with various herbs and spices, bears more than a passing resemblance to our own national delicacy. As was pointed out by Bayan Sami Abdul Rahman, the Kurdish regional group's high representative to the UK, we both have a population of five million. We too are proud of our highlands and landscapes. We have devolved administrations and are rich in natural resources. The Scottish Government have been proactive in fostering close ties between Kurdish and Scottish officials. Meetings between the First Minister and Karim Sinjari, the Kurdistan Regional Government's Interior Minister, focused on developing areas of future cooperation from education, health, policing, energy and business to culture and heritage. Scotland has already provided some police training in Kurdistan and Mr Sinjari and Cabinet Secretary for Justice Kenny McCaskill have already discussed ways to take this forward and to widen cooperation. Presiding Officer, once again, I congratulate Bob Doris for bringing this debate to the Chamber and, along with members of all parties, look forward to deepening the relationship between the Scottish and Kurdish peoples and to embracing the Kurdish community as a vital and valued part of a vibrant and multicultural Scotland. Many thanks. Now call on John Lamont to be followed by Hanzala Malik. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I too begin by congratulating Bob Doris um, for securing this evening's debate, as well as welcoming those in the gallery who have travelled here to be with us in the Scottish Parliament um, tonight. I must say, however, that it is with mixed emotion that I make my um, speech this evening, reflecting on the atrocities such as those systematically inflicted on the Kurdish um, people since the early 1980s is never something to savour. However, this evening's debate provides us with an opportunity to remember those crimes, to learn the lessons that we can, and importantly, to celebrate the Kurdish people, their future and their con contribution to Scotland. Firstly, Deputy Presiding Officer, to remembering, it is 25 years and 10 days ago that the skies above Halabja rained bombs, both conventional and chemical, on its innocent inhabitants. An estimated 5,000 civilians were massacred over the two-day bombardment, with a further 10,000 injured, some of which in the most unimaginable ways. Of course, the massacre at Talabja was just one part of the Anfal campaign, during which, at the behest of Saddam Hussein, some 180,000 Kurds lost their lives between 1987 and 1989. It is right that we remember these outrageous atrocities, and it is for this reason that I recently lodged a motion in this Parliament, for this Parliament to remember the struggles of the Kurdish people and to formally recognise the genocide committed against them. I am pleased that so many members um, supported that motion. 
I also think that it's a tribute to the Scottish Parliament, as well as an indication that we take the Kurdish population and their interests, both at home and abroad, seriously, that the formal recognition of the Anfal genocide was also the subject of motions by both Labour and the SNP. Deputy Presiding Officer, today is a significant and symbolic occasion on which the Kurdish genocide can receive further parliamentary recognition. Secondly, Deputy Presiding Officer, I turn to the lessons that we can learn from the events in Kurdistan over the past 25 years. And now, as all of us here tonight will surely agree, there are profound lessons to be learned at that. For my own part, the Kurdish experience confirmed my belief that human nature is incompatible with totalitarianism and that only when a people are liberated from tyranny can they pro uh, progress, prosper and flourish. Presiding officer, this gives me, brings me to my third point. What can we celebrate 25 years on from um, Halabja and the Anfal campaign? Since liberation in 1991, in Kurdistan we have seen democracy flourish, the economy prosper, civil society blossom, and the regeneration of its civil rights and liberties. Kurdistan now has seven public universities bringing higher education to its citizens. It has a stable and democratically elected parliament with a percentage of women re representatives similar to the level here in this parliament. It has progressive laws which have banned female circumcision and protect women from domestic abuse. And violence, terrorist activity and the persecution of religious and political minorities are significant lo significantly lower, in some cases non-existent, in comparison to the rest of Iraq. Deputy Presiding Officer, all of these serve to underline Kurdistan's place as a progressive beacon in the Middle East. And tonight serves as an opportunity to celebrate Scotland's links with Kurdistan, both internationally in the relationship between our two parliaments and governments, but also nationally with Kurds who live and work in Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, we must never forget the atrocities committed against Kurds. Atrocities which led the head of the Iraqi Graves Commission to remark that there is another Iraq buried under Iraq. Tonight's debate allows us to remember, to learn and to celebrate. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Hans Alan Malik, after which we will move to the Minister for the closing speech. Uh, presiding Officer, I, st I first of all want to thank Bob Doris for achieving today's debate. And I would like to start with the words Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. For the record, it means in the name of God, the benevolent and the merciful, and Assalamu Alaikum, meaning peace be upon you all, in particular our guests today in the chamber, but more importantly, brothers and sisters back home. I too would like to add my voice to urge the Scottish Government to formally recognize the genocide against the people of Iraqi Kurdistan and to encourage the European Union and the United Nations to do likewise, as many others seem to have escaped prosecution. This will enable the Kurdish people, many in Scotland, to feel a sense of achievement and justice for their loss. And as the UK government has already done with the leadership of Bayan campaigning in the UK, and I want wish to congratulate her and her team in achieving that uh, achievement in Parliament. Genocide has been on for decades. In fact, in early 1963, it involved the deportation of ordinary Kurds, Kurdish people. And in 1970s and 80s, the use of chemical weapons were used. And finally, the campaign in 1987-88, where hundreds of thousands, thousands of innocent people died. Families tore apart. Over 4,500 villages were destroyed between 1976 and 1988 alone. Genocide at its worst, while the whole world sat back and did nothing. And I say did nothing. And that's shame on us that we allowed that to happen in this day and age. However, on a positive note, I have to say that I personally have been very fortunate. I have made at least two visits to Kurdistan in recent years, and I'm planning a third visit there. I have received six delegations from Kurdistan who have had meetings ranging from the First Minister, just Minister of Justice, Minister of Education, many other officials and members alike. 
all in a bit to try and do our bit in trying to correct history. I have done at least two reports in Kurdistan. I have presented the First Minister with one of those reports, and there's a third report being done just now in trying to explore how we can recognize areas of support and how we can offer support to our friends in Kurdistan. We're looking at education, possible university campuses in Kurdistan, and, of course, students coming to Scotland to study. And it's already been mentioned that we're looking at law and order and policing. I had the privilege of visiting the training center in, in Erbil, uh, and I have to say that I was very impressed with the level of training and, more importantly, the feel that I was getting from young students who actually felt an ownership and they were feeling that they can actually work with the community rather be dictated and be abused by the police force. A new concept in policing. We also looked at water supplies and water treatment issues, gas and oil energy exploration. And finally, presiding officer, we are now exploring the possibility of ministerial visits to Kurdistan. Once again, in a bit to try and bridge, build, bridge the gaps between our communities. Kurdistan is very similar to Scotland, approximately 5 million population, a mountainous region. But the shame of all of this is that the genocide that took place, it was the innocent people that suffered. People who were trying to make a living, scratching a living, on barren, hard land with no irrigation facilities, targeted from poison gas and weapons, I still can't understand how they got away with it. I still don't understand why we human beings allow this to happen internationally. Of course. Well, brothers, uh, Mr. Malik, for, for giving way. Uh, I, I agree with all the sentiments expressed by Hans Alla. Malik, uh, the, the European Union and the United Nations were mentioned. I believe that genocide should be formally recognised by both those institutions, but not just for an end in itself, because rather than individual parliaments recognising genocide, the strength of the United Nations in particular would be the entire international community who turned their back on the people of Kurdistan would be formally recognising the genocide there, and that would be a powerful, cathartic experience for the international community to make sure such events never happen again. Hans Alan Malik. Thank you for that uh, contribution. I, I agree with you, and that's the reason why I suggested that we need to ensure that the UN actually takes this on board, because we continuously see genocide taking place around the world, and I think we really need to say enough is enough, and we really need to, we really need to learn lessons, and I think Young parliaments like the Scottish Parliament has a, an important role to play to add its voice to all the world governments to say, we too wish this to happen. We too want you to take this on board. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now call on Humza Yousaf, Minister, seven minutes, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you to, to Bob Doris for tabling this motion, securing uh, this debate, which will promote greater understanding of the plight of Iraqi Kurds, uh, also highlighting and commemorating, of course, uh, those uh, terrible tragedies of Halabja and the Anfal campaign, but also, quite importantly, as every member has done, allow us to reflect upon the contribution that the Kurdish community has made to Scotland. I, too, add my voice and the voice of the Scottish Government in welcoming uh, the Kurdish community here uh, to our Parliament and to their Parliament. Last week, um, this parliament reflected on 10 years, uh, 10 year anniversary of the start of the war in Iraq. And when coalition forces entered Iraq looking for, for those weapons of mass destruction, they found mass graves concealing men, women and children, all killed for nothing but their ethnicity. Last week also, as members have said, marked the 25th anniversary of the Anfal campaign, the last and most well-known phase of persecution against the Iraqi Kurds in 87-88. It is estimated that 180,000 people perished in a systematic ethnic cleansing programme. And as was said by Hanzala Malik, perhaps many more that we do not even still to this day know about. Instigated, of course, by Saddam Hussein and the Ba'athist regime against the mainly Kurdish population in northern Iraq. These these atrocities uh, were characterised by the gross violation of human rights, mass executions and disappearances of men, women and children, the widespread use of chemical weapons, including mustard gas and the nerve agent sarin, 
the worst incident being as many members have reflected in Halabja, where 5,000 civilian inhabitants are thought to have died in an aerial bombardment in one go uh, using these chemical weapons. The destruction of 2,000 villages as well as dozens and dozens of towns and administrative centres. Huge numbers being imprisoned without just cause other than their presumed, um, presumed sympathy for the Kurdish. In 1993, the Human Rights Watch report on the Anfal campaign against the Iraqi Kurds concluded this crime far transcended legitimate counterinsurgency and included the murder and disappearance of tens of thousands of non-combatants due to their ethnic national identity. There can be no doubt presiding officer, this was ethnic cleansing. The events of 87-88 are a tragic example of a man's inhumanity and act as a reminder that Scotland's strong and enduring commitment to human rights cannot be taken for granted. It places a responsibility upon us as a nation to ensure that other countries develop and maintain that similar commitment. Uh, the Scottish Government's international work uh, also reflects upon uh, Scotland's enduring social democratic values. We also use our international engagement as an opportunity to help increase respect for an understanding of human rights worldwide, not through arrogant lecturing, but of course through mature, even tempered discourse with our international partners. We have ongoing dialogue with states at ministerial and official level raising human rights with appropriate and diplomatic and culturally sensitive fashion. I mention that, presiding officer, because as was mentioned by, by John Lamont uh, and uh, others indeed uh, across the chamber, that not everything is necessarily rosy. Things are improving, of course, in, 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 in northern Iraq. But still, not everything is rosy, and there still are human rights abuses that are regularly uh, flagged up. Um, developing these relations with those countries then um, helps uh, further uh, increase our understanding of shared world values. I'd like to uh, take a moment to reflect, as others have done in Scotland's uh, and Kurdistan's relationship that was mentioned by, again, many members, Jim Eady, uh, John, uh, John Lamont, uh, and also Hans Allah Malik, as well as, of course, uh, Bob Doris, uh, really giving their own personal accounts of how that relationship uh, has built, be it from visits, inward delegations, or indeed by the fact that they have members of the Kurdish community in their constituencies and in their regions. Scotland and Kurdistan do share many com commonalities, um, population of 5 million, oil, water and gas being our main natural resources, uh, and uh, we are both located north of a perhaps more populous uh, neighbour. The Scottish Government hosted two interns from the Kurdistan Regional Government on a work placement in 2011 in order to help Kurdistan develop its understanding of devolved government procedures. Our ministers have also met with representatives of the Kurdistan regional government, as was mentioned, to explore areas in which our two countries can work together and where Scotland can share her expertise in the fields of business, finance, uh, education and engaging with the diaspora. And I do welcome that role, as others have done. Uh, I do welcome that contribution that the Kurdish diaspora and other populations make to Scottish society. Uh, for generations, Scotland has opened its doors to refugees, to students, to migrant workers and visitors across the world, all of whom have contributed through their ideas, their skills and their talents to build our country's future. One thing I often say, presenting officer, is that uh, um, in Scotland we often take uh, from the best from, from, from our uh, migrant populations, from those new Scots, uh, and I always say that cuisine is one of the things that benefits the most. And I always say that uh, from, the, from the Italian community, we took spaghetti bolognese. From the Pakistani and Indian community, we took chicken tikka masala. And it seems Jamiri has uh, perhaps suggested and alluded to that we've taken haggis uh, from our Kurdish population. That might be a controversial uh, thing to say. But indeed, uh, we take from the best and we have taken much uh, from our Kurdish community. We don't see here in Scotland, we don't see ethnic, religious and cultural diversity as anything to be threatened by. Rather, we see it as something to be embraced, uh, embraced as contributing to making Scotland a safer and stronger and more inclusive society. Presiding officer, this debate is about remembering those who did no crime but were subjected to the worst punishment. In the modern day and age we live in, it can be easy, I think, to become desensitised to violence and to tragedy. However, the stories of the most profound human suffering cannot help but affect us all. So let me conclude this debate by assuring members that the Scottish Government recognises that immense suffering of the Kurdish people during this terrible period in history. Members will be aware, getting to the substance of 
uh, perhaps uh, one element of this motion, is that members will be aware that foreign affairs are, of course, uh, a reserved matter for the UK Government. Uh, but I am pleased that the Scottish Government will be passing uh, this motion, be debating this motion with consensus from across the parties that welcomes the 2005 Hague decision that formally recognised the 1988 attacks as genocide, uh, and, and that actually the decisions and joins this Parliament also joins in with the UK Parliament, the Norwegian Parliament, and the Swedish Parliament to do the same. Uh, but having said that, um, we also know that foreign affairs are, of course, reserved. And at a recent debate, uh, Alistair Butt, the House of Commons, uh, in, in the House of Commons, the FCO Minister Alistair Butt said that genocide was not a term for the UK government to decide upon, but a legal decision to be taken in international fora. The UK government's current position, we believe, is not sufficient. And I believe that's something that they recognise themselves. So I therefore commit to work with um, the Scottish Government, to work with uh, my colleague Bob Doris, the leaders within the Scottish Kurdish community, to impress upon the UK Government that a route to appropriately, appropriately recognise the ANFAL campaign internationally should be found in a more robust response uh, forthcoming from the UK Government. Uh, there is no question in my mind to conclude, Presiding Officer, and the minds of decent people around the world, that the people of Iraqi Kurdistan were the victims of the most unspeakable crimes perpetrated by a vicious and evil regime, a regime which had no hesitation in committing crimes against humanity and slaughtering the innocent simply because of their identity, language and desire from fear, uh, from fear and oppression. The Anfal campaign is a stain on our collective conscience that we must never allow it to happen again. Thank you very much. And that concludes this debate, and I now close this meeting of Parliament. Thank you.